even before my son was born, I wanted him to do well in life. I mean, who wants their child to be a failure, right? My husband and I even jokingly drew up a list of family members who could tutor our son when he was older, who could help him out in English, in maths, even in chess or coding. We called the list our son's pathway to success. It was a joke, but still, it made me realise how much we instinctively associate success in life with academic qualifications. And it made me wonder, would my child hate me for pushing him too hard? Or what if I decided not to push him at all academically and he ended up doing badly and resenting me after that? I'm Leanne, a journalist with CNA Insider and mother of a two-year-old boy. And it's guilty dilemmas like this that drive me to seek out conversations with other parents who've been in similar predicaments. Each week on this podcast, I dive into the things that make us question our imperfect parenting choices. Am I a bad parent if I do this? Or if I don't do that? Nowhere does that dilemma seem to apply more than to our children's education. The tuition industry in Singapore is worth more than a billion dollars. I've seen parents on social media talk about sending their infants or toddlers to enrichment classes, and it seems pretty normal for them to give their children tuition from when they start primary school. But now and then, there are parents who buck the trend. Parents like Paulin. My name is Tio Paulin and I'm a mother of two. I knew her as a former journalist who used to write about lifestyle. These days, she runs her own cake studio while raising two girls aged 15 and 13. And she describes her parenting style as... relaxed. I'm a real slack parent. I'm actually very lazy. By that, she means... I don't know, I just, I just want to just have fun with my kid. If they do well enough, that's fine. You know, no need to go overboard. In school, we're totally okay with them getting Bs. It's fine. You don't need to get As. A star, no need lah. You know, it's fine. As long as your Bs, you're doing okay, that's good enough for us. We don't really push them. Not pushing them means that tuition wasn't something she believed in saddling her two girls with when they were in primary school. There's a lot of money saved on our part. <laughs> I like to think that the money that we saved on tuition, we spent on holidays, you know, like... <laughs> Very good choice though. Yes, yeah, everybody happy, yeah. Let's go back a few years. It was 2014 and Paulin's oldest daughter, Anne, had just started primary one. She was invited by the parents of another girl in Anne's class to join a parents' WhatsApp group chat. And at first she figured, why not? Somehow, every time you go into a new class, there will be one parent who's the super organised one who will just somehow put a name out there and say, OK, who wants to set up like this group chat? There will always be one parent, yeah. And you can be sure that I'm never that parent. <laughs> it quickly became clear what the parents in the chat group were mainly obsessed about. They're always talking about tuition and what kind of enrichment classes everybody's going and which one is good, which one is bad, and complaining about teachers. Being plugged in might have felt great. It might even have seemed necessary to those other parents. But for Paulin... I just find it very stressful. It reached the point where she thought enough was enough. So, yeah, ignorance is bliss. And I think there's a big part of me that's just like, I'm cooler than that. You know, I don't want to be that kind of parent. The kind of parent that Paulin wanted to be was the cool sort. The kind who hung out with her girls after school and encouraged them to take afternoon naps and have fun. Every day around 5 o'clock, we'll just shoo them out, go out and play with the neighbours' kids. So we'll just run around and play their own thing, catch insects, you know, things like that. Just have fun. She did insist that they finish their homework. But beyond that, she wanted them to have time for hobbies like watercolour painting and drawing. And of course, time with the family. Fridays would be like movie nights and then we'll always watch Netflix. Saturdays are absolutely no school, no tuition, nothing. Weekends for us is all about family. All this meant that from primary one to four, she did not give her daughters any tuition. In fact, they both told her they were the only ones in their class without any tuition. But when Anne hit primary five, the work suddenly got a lot harder. That's when she started failing maths and science. Time to start panicking, really. I'm talking about 
40 something percent that's quite scary right PSLE this following year you know so it's like okay we better do something about this Every parent in Singapore dreads the PSLE, or Primary School Leaving Examination. It's the first national exam students face, and it determines which secondary school they go to. So naturally, this puts a lot of pressure on students and their parents. A little caveat here. In 2021, the Education Ministry changed the PSLE scoring system to ease some of this pressure. Students are now grouped according to broader achievement levels. But back in 2019, when Anne took the exam, the T-score system was in place. Students' fates were decided by a score out of a possible 300. Just a few points could make all the difference. To Pauline, Anne's grades felt like the school telling her, if you haven't already gotten tuition, you'd better get it now. So she did. Anne started taking tuition classes twice a week. So definitely we tightened the reins a little bit more, but I don't think it was very bad still. The tuition seemed to help because Anne's maths and science grades improved. So it seemed to Pauline that they had things well in hand. The afternoon naps continued, and every Friday was still movie night. When everyone else is starting to stress out over PSLE, why, why is it you were still okay with letting her do all these things? I think I just kind of knew that she's going to be okay. Maybe because she's got my genes. <laughs> And I did quite well for my PSLE, so I had this false sense of confidence, you know. Ah, yeah, you know, she'll be fine, lah, you know. Besides, Anne had done well in her preliminary exams, so what was there to worry about, right? After all, it's not like they were gunning for the top schools in the country, which were crazy competitive. Pauline's shortlist was a tad more modest. Maybe a girls' school, because in my mind, the better schools are the girls' schools, right? No distraction from boys, right? <laughs> and so, Pauline left it at that. On the day of the PSLE results, Pauline and her husband showed up at Anne's school, expecting things to go pretty smoothly. Parents and students gathered in the school hall, where the principal gave an overview of the school's results. So the principal was saying, ah, oh, we have very good results this year. It was a very, very, very high percentage, like 90-something, or more than 240. So I was like, ah, oh, no problem, man. <laughs> no problem. That's our kid, man. That's our kid. Then it was time for the students to go to their classrooms to get their results. Pauline and her husband hovered outside with the other parents, peeking through the louvered windows. One by one, as each student went up to the teacher and collected their results slip, a nervous Anne covered her face with her hands. Then it was her turn. And then when she got her Result slips, she looked at the number and her whole face fell. And it almost turned a different colour. So we're like, what is it? What is it? She showed us her, her fingers, you know, what, what was her score? And so it was not in the 2-4 something range. It was not in the 2-3 something range. It was lower than that. Okay, so it was, re I mean, it wasn't very bad. It wasn't very bad. She, um, she qualified for Express Stream, um, but it was definitely not what we were expecting. So I think she was, she was a bit like, she was quite shocked. Um, and to be honest, so was I. <laughs> Pauline couldn't quite wrap her head around what had just happened. But in that moment, their priority was to make sure Anne was okay. So we said, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. We just kept mouthing to her, it's okay, it's okay. When she came out, we just carried on, you know, uh, valiantly. Let's celebrate, you know, let's go for lunch, you know. So we just kind of stumbled out of the school, stumbled into the car, kind of drove around like in a, a bit in a daze. And then somehow we just found like some place, some Japanese place, and we just sat down and we ate and like still in the kind of hyped up, let's celebrate mood, like, you know, just still eating and all that. And it didn't really hit me until nighttime when I realised, oh dear, <laughs> oh dear, this is the results are really not very good. That's when the full implications of Anne's results hit her. She couldn't qualify for any of the schools Marlin had shortlisted. What she could qualify for would be schools that I don't know anything about, that I don't even know existed, but I had to go and do some research now. And that's when I actually broke down and cried in front of my child. <laughs> Tell me how that went. I just went, I, I just, I can't remember what I said, but I just said that something to the fact that what kind of school can we go to now? The 
The next day, Baolin apologised to Anne. I had to explain to her that, you know, um, Mama cried not because I'm disappointed in you, but because I was just, this is just not what I was expecting and I'm a bit shocked. Over the next few days, Baolin struggled to keep it together. I would come to work and then I would just think about it and, and tears would just be rolling down my eyes in the middle of work. And I'd say, oh, what have I done? What have I done? Who am I to think that I can go against the system if everybody else is doing it? In short, I felt like I had ruined my child's future. Along with the guilt and shame, Paulin also felt a sense of betrayal. I think a lot of the reason why I was quite slack and not really dependent on the whole tuition system was because of my faith. As a Christian, Paulin believed that God had everything under control and Anne would end up in a good school. And so by taking this step of faith, I felt as if God didn't held his end of the bargain, that he didn't look out for us. How did your daughter feel? Um, I think... After we kind of assured her and after I apologised to her after my outburst, <laughs> I think she was okay. I think maybe her only concern is really just meeting our expectations. And because we never really told her we want you to go to this school or that school or whatever, she never really had any kind of preconceived ideas about what's good and bad. So therefore she's fine, you just go along with it. It sounds like you might have taken it worse than she did. Absolutely. The only person who was absolutely distraught was me. She was fine. <laughs> When it came time to choose a secondary school for Anne, the choice actually became a very simple one. We narrowed it down to two schools, and then between these two, we settled on the one that had a direct bus from our home. Paulin knew nothing about the school other than the fact that it was co-ed, boys and girls learning together. So she looked up its website. The first thing she read was the principal's welcome speech. I just found so much comfort in his words. One of the things that he said was that your child's score does not determine his future. This was exactly something that I needed to hear. Paulin thinks that subconsciously, she already knew this. The PSLE didn't define a person's life. After all, she found this out for herself as she was growing up. As a 12-year-old, Paulin had aced the PSLE and was even one of the top scorers in Singapore. By O levels, I was still kind of okay, but A levels is just like completely crash and burn. <laughs> okay. So by looking at my PSLE score, you think that I'll become like president of Singapore, right? But look at me now, I'm making cakes for a living. So, you know, it's really not an indicator of your future. But I will say that you make very nice cakes. Oh, thank so you. So good. <laughs> good. <laughs> Paulin went on to enroll Anne in the secondary school. But when she told others about her decision... I told my neighbour that we're going to go to this school and she said, hey, this is a gangster school, you know. And I spoke to another neighbour and she said, oh yeah, this one, um, yeah, the boys, they smoke, you know. And the, oh gosh. So in the few weeks leading up to the start of school, Paulin's anxiety kicked into high gear. I was just really oscillating between being hopeful and being absolutely terrified. Like, oh my gosh, what, where, what kind of school is this? Where am I sending my child to, you know? It was with some apprehension that Pauline sent Anne off on her first day at a new school. When Anne got home, she told her mom that... On the very first day of school, somebody threw a chair down from the fourth floor. And so that pretty much set the tone for, <laughs> for the rest of the year. Anne would come home with stories of fights, students caught vaping, a teacher even told a class that they were the worst class. Paulin couldn't help but worry, but there was nothing really she could do. Bopiana, because she's already been in the school, so we just have to stay there, roll with it, and see what happens, ah. Uh. Whenever she felt anxious, she told herself that there was a purpose to what she was going through. What got me through was really my faith again. I suspect that she's really placed there for a reason. So it was really a posture of hope and just let's wait and see. Lah. So she did. As the weeks went by, Anne started to settle into her new school. She made friends, joined school activities, and was even given a leadership position. She would say, oh, yeah, you know, the holidays is fun, but I'm really looking forward to school. 
Yes, Anne still struggled with maths and science. But Paulin was coming to realise, with some surprise, that the school environment actually suited her daughter very well. She is amongst other students who are of the same or similar level. That means the teaching is actually done at a slower pace than, say, compared to a top school where everything is just done very, very fast because the students can catch on fast. I think a lot of parents might be concerned that the standard of teaching or whatnot may not be as good in a neighbourhood school as compared to Mm. a a prestigious school. So I just wanted to get a sense whether Mm. it was like that in your experience. I think that in every school you will have your good teachers and also your not so effective teachers, even for the top schools. So I would say that in her school, yeah, same. You know, you have some teachers who are very good and very dedicated and there are also the others that's like really not very good. But I don't think that it has affected her adversely. Beyond academics, Paulin also realised that the school environment brought out a very different side of Anne. Suddenly, I just saw like this boldness in her. So, you know, she's in a class with a lot of naughty boys, right? And she suddenly just rose up and she's the type who would just give as well as she took. She also took the rather, shall we say, lively school environment in her stride. She's like, this is life, right? So there was one time, I think my husband was just like, on YouTube and showing her like a video of people fighting or something. And then she looked at it and she said, ah, this is all fighting. Ah, yeah, the boys in my school can fight better. So all these things are, she's like, nah, you know, no sweat. You know? And I like that about her. In a way, Anne was being given an advantage that Pauline herself didn't get when she was her age. I went to a girls' school or secondary school and I was such a swaku, you know, like I never had to go to school with boys until I was in JC and I was like, so I didn't know how to act, I didn't know how to behave and and just always so awkward and all. But I can see her now, she's totally comfortable with boys. Changes a lot from previously how you mentioned that you were looking for girls' schools for her, right? Yeah. I'm such a believer in co-ed schools now that for my younger daughter, I want her to go to a co-ed school too. <laughs> It's just girls' schools, right? Yeah, 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 it's always the girls' school because, like, uh, in my time, the like, girls' schools are the better ones and it keeps you away from boys, keeps you away from trouble and all, you know? I take a different view now. That's not the only issue where Paulin has had a change of perspective. Anne is now studying for her O-level exams this year. She started to consider her post-secondary options and is keen on design courses at a polytechnic. For Paulin, this means accepting the fact that her daughter won't be going to a junior college. In Paulin's time, a JC education was considered the way to go. Poly is really for people who cannot make it JC, right? And then if you go to poly, that's it. Poly, that means you just go straight to work and you don't really go further to university. But it's times are different now. I think it's really, from what I have learned, poly is really actually very, very good for certain things. It depends on what you want, right? So for my daughter, if she wants to go into design, there's really no point going to JC where you learn how to write essays and things like that. It just doesn't serve her. So I have to adjust to that. Looking back, it's pretty clear to Paulin that Anne's situation has turned out well. She's also had a bit of an epiphany about herself and why she'd felt so distraught over Anne's PSLE result. Maybe it's a reflection of me that I didn't try hard enough, I didn't push her hard enough, I didn't give her the kind of help that she needed to do better, all these things. I thought that it made me look bad. I've come a long way. (laughs) A long way indeed. But that doesn't mean she's completely free of residual guilt and the what-ifs. Particularly when... Like, you know, when I'm talking to my friends and their child is in this school or this amazing school or that high-ranking school and they're, like, representing the school in this spot and, like, winning trophies for whatever, you know? And then I'm like, oh, okay. (laughs) Well, I'm not that, (sighs) you know? So that's when I have to, like, pull myself together again and just remind myself of the positives. If you ask her what's the big lesson she's taken away from all this... It's to get to know your child's specific style of learning and helping them accordingly. You see, Anne is messy, laid back. Needs a lot more pushing. She just takes her time and she's okay with teachers scolding her. But Anne's younger sister is very different. A lot more self-motivated. She takes pride in her works. She loves to drop lists and timetables and all that. You know, you don't even need to tell her that she will just do it herself. That's how different they are. For the record... Paulin's younger daughter aced the PSLE and was posted to an integrated program school, 
which lets students skip the O-levels and go straight to junior college. Paulin feels this is the best fit for her. Just as the school that Anne ended up in also turned out to be the right thing at the right time. If she were to just by force of will and through thousands of dollars and hours of tuition, she managed to get into a top school, I don't think it will serve her well because then she will be competing against a different type of student. And so she will just end up feeling miserable about herself. Do you regret not giving her tuition? No, I don't regret it at all. I think because there was no tuition, I think we kind of ingrained in her that academics is not everything. And so therefore, I think personality-wise, I think she's quite well-adjusted. She's quite happy generally. I think this is priceless. The fact that she can look back upon her childhood and she has nice memories of just playing and family time. Talking to Paulin has made me think about my two-year-old son, Evan, and all those plans we made, mostly in jest, to set him up for success. Already, I've been encouraged to send him for enrichment classes. Think Mandarin... Music, swimming, gym. I also see my friends posting on social media about their kids' amazing experiences with such classes. Should I be taking this whole hot housing thing more seriously? Am I wrong to not want to push him just yet? What if I don't? And he ends up lagging behind his peers in school. For Paulin, the matter is simple. I try not to make parenting decisions based on comparison. You know, like, oh, my friend is doing this and this and this for the child, so I must do it. All our children have different strengths and gifts. So instead of always just pointing at the weaknesses and trying to fix the weakness, can we not just focus on the strengths and try to think of how to nurture and to grow the strengths? Did Balin's story resonate with you? What are some of the other things you've done that make you wonder if you're getting the parenting thing wrong? I want to hear from you. Record a message of yourself talking about it and send it to us at cnainsider at mediacorp.com.sg. We might just play it in a future podcast. I'm Lian Chia, and this has been Imperfect, a podcast by CNA Insider. It's sound engineered by Jonathan Yeo, with intern assistance from Koei Tan and input from supervising editor Yvonne Lim and senior editor Crispina Roberts.